Savior, Savior, hear my humbling cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Amen. Amen. If we have our Bibles this morning, our electronic devices with us, turn with me to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Amen. We're going to look at verses 9 through 18. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. Amen. Amen. When you have it, would you signify by standing to your feet for the reading of the word for those who can. If you cannot stand, we understand. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. Amen. First Samuel chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. I will read from the New Living Translation of the Scripture, so if my version reads a little differently from yours, do not worry, we'll read the same thing. Once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli, the priest, was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly, as she prayed to the Lord, and she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime, and as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. As she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her. Seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound, he thought that she had been, drunk, had been drinking it. Must you come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. Oh, no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything strong, but I am very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think that I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, he might say, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. Thus far, the word of God, you may be seated. In Amen. Amen. The title of our sermon this morning is, In Times of Desperation, Prayer is the Answer. In Times of Desperation, Prayer is the Answer. Now, I'm about to date myself. I'm about to show you how old I am because I'm... And we'll see how old some of us are in here. Because when I was growing up, one of my favorite cartoons to watch in the afternoon was Popeye. Amen. For those old enough to remember, Popeye was this ugly, short, squat, rotund sailor. All right? He used to have uh, that wooden cob pipe in his mouth. And he used to talk with a chuckle. And, 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 and actually, he used to sound geeky. You know, uh, and he was in love with olive oil. Olive oil stood eight foot three inches tall to his two foot seven inch friend. Amen. Uh, but she loved herself some Papa. Amen. Those of us old enough to remember will remember that Papa had an arch enemy, a nemesis. His name was Brutus. Brutus was a big, burly, bearded man. I mean, he was as wide as he was tall. And unfortunately for, for Brutus, Olive Oil did not love him the way that he loved her. He, In his mind, he thought Olive Oil should be his wife, his girlfriend, his, his paramour, his significant other. But no matter what he did to get her affection, he would always come up short because she would always go to uh, choose Papa. Now, this whole thing of this cartoon was that Brutus, every day, in the 22 minutes that the cartoon was on, in the half hour segment, would come up with some kind of plot that was supposed to take Papa out. It was supposed to wipe him out, kill him, remove him from the picture, so that Brutus would have unfettered access to all of them. And what we would see every show was that right when Popeye was in that predicament, looked like it was going to take his life, he would pull out of his pants this huge can of spinach. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. 
The whole time I ain't seen this can of spinach nowhere on his bike. But he'll pull it out, he squeeze the middle of the can, the spinach will jump out, and he'll open his mouth, and it fall in his mouth, and all of a sudden he'll become super strong, super fast, super smart, and he will beat <laughs> on, on Brutus, all right? Now, as wonderful as that is with that spinach, that ain't what we watched the show for. Popeye had a one-liner that he would say. And we would wait for this one-liner hook, bait, and sink for him to say it. And it never changed. He never modified it. It was almost like the telltale sign that something was getting ready to happen. He would look at Brutus and he would say, I stand all I can stand and I can't stand no more. Okay, I guess I was not going to watch that. Hey, amen. Praise God. That was his declaration. That Brutus, you have had it up to here. You, yeah, you have tied me up, put me on a conveyor belt that's headed toward a saw to end my life. Yeah, you tied me up to a pole and let lit fire to the bottom of the pole. But I'm telling you, I am sick and tired of you, and I'm so sick and tired of you that I want you to know I stand all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. Hannah is there this morning. Hannah, Elkanah's wife and said and declared in no uncertain terms this morning that she has stands all she can stands and she can't stands no more. All right. Hannah, Elkanah's wife, is unable to have children. She and Elkanah have been married. They don't, they don't say how long they've been married, but let's assume long enough that they've been unsuccessful having children. Let's be for real, it takes nine months to birth a child. And back then you didn't have x-ray, back then you didn't have ultrasound, so if you thought you were pregnant, you had to at least wait till you started showing. And how many women who have children know that you don't start showing immediately? It takes some time to show. And so she has been married long enough that they have tried repeatedly to have children and have been unsuccessful. They have, in fact, I think if, 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 if I could peek back into the day, I'm sure she and Elkanah did, did whatever the, the latest thing was to determine pregnancy and to conceive children. I, whatever that process was, whatever the EPT test was back in the day, they used it. Whatever was the methodology, you know, because they got all these folk tales, all these wonderful things of how to conceive babies. They probably did it. I'm sure that Hannah probably drove Elkanah up the wall and back down the other side. I'm sure she's like, don't go too far today because my mama's coming over here. My sister's coming over here. We're going to determine when I'm ovulating. And when I find out when I'm ovulating, you need to be in here so we can have a baby. Come on, someone. Tell the truth and shame the devil. That we, have, when we wanted to have kids, we've gone through the process of wanting a kids. We've gone through whatever the scientific method of having kids is, as if there is a scientific method to having kids, and we and we have put our best forward. But what happens when we have put our best forward and we cannot produce that which we think we should be able to produce? Let me be honest with you. It wasn't until I was married with uh, my wife and we were trying to have children that I realized how important and how how sensitive the topic of having babies is to many women. You know, because here, I'm a man. I don't carry this baby. <laughs> Let's be real. It, the baby won't be in my body. I don't have to go through the process of birthing the baby. Now, I'm, I was right there. Now, let me say, I was right there with her. She wasn't alone. But I didn't have to birth the baby. She did. I don't know what that contraction feels like. And, and, and no man in here does. But it did make me realize that if a woman is designed to birth children, and she is unable to birth those children, the children that she wants to birth, then there is the quite the, the possibility, the chance, that some women will feel some kind of way about themselves because they cannot do what they've been created to do. I know, I, I know it's quiet right here, so let me, I, I know the women are like, okay, you need to get off of this, leave us alone. Amen. So let me let me let me move it to, to, to another to, to over into more general so the brothers can get on board with this. All right. You've been called to to serve a purpose. You've been called to a calling. You've been called to do something on behalf of God. And you've been given your best to do it. You've given your all. You've studied. You've practiced. You've got the resources. You, you committed yourself. You've been in prayer to do this thing that God has called you to do. And every time you get up to try to do it, it fails. 
You're not successful. You get a big goose egg. Let me, let me, let me make this, let me, let me share personally. At one point, I heard God is clearly say, I want you to start a ministry. And the issue say, I did try. Back in 2005, I did try to start a ministry. And I mean, I studied, I prepared, I preached like I preach now. You know, have my, have my crackers and my grape juice for, 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 for Holy Communion. And no matter what I did, it failed miserably. All right? At one point when I had six members, you thought I had 60,000. Frat brothers and friends like, hey, we're going on. No, I can't go right now. I got to go home and study because I got to be prepared for my members. And even then, God put a pause on that thing. And he said, it's not time. It didn't work out. The potential for me to say, I give up. I give up, God. I'm just going to go back to being who I was, go back over here, was real high, was real great. It was God's intercession that allowed me to keep moving forward, trusting him to go where he had me to go so that when it was time to birth the ministry, we were able to birth it this time successfully. Amen. 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 But let's, we, 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 get, we, get, we can get with God on the second time. But I want to talk to the people who are still in the first time. They're still wrestling with this thing. You're still trying to figure out there's got to be another way to skin the cat. There's got to be another way to make this thing happen. Hannah knew that if, that if she and Elkanah just kept trying to have kids, the odds were she, they would eventually have kids. You know how we play that. The one and something, something odds. I mean, let's be real. That's why many of us go out and buy lottery tickets. Don't sit here and pretend like you ain't been buying the lottery tickets <laughs> when it's been $400 million sitting in the pot. We go because we hope we are the one and however many to win the lottery. And it's amazing how we will have perseverance and persistence and tenacity to win a lottery, but not have the same perseverance, persistence, and tenacity to do what thus says the Lord. That's another sermon. I'm not going to go there today. Amen. So here, Hannah is trying to have a child, trying to birth a child. And you know what the real bad thing about that was? She has a sister wife. At this time, the culture was that if you could, if you could afford more than one wife, you could have as many as you could afford. So guess what? Elkanah was a wealthy man. He could afford more than one wife. He had a wife named Penina. And Penina was dropping babies like these young kids drop it like it's hot. All right? <laughs> Every time they turned around, here was a new child. When the woman sneezed, a child came out. It seemed like she, if she walked by, the babies are us, she had twins. <laughs> Come on, someone knows that they know how that feels. Here it is, you're trying to do whatever you need to do, and you're trying to be faithful to God about doing it, and here's someone over here who is not even trying, doesn't really even care for God. It seems to be walking in God's favor, and you're looking at God like, wait a second, God, how wrong can that be? I'm the one who came to service. I'm the one who gave my tithes and offer. I'm the one who actually trusted you. I'm the one that prays for you, prays to you. I'm the one who believes in God. You're going to do all these kind of things. And here this person over here, they won't even get up and come to church on Sunday morning and you are blessing them beyond measure. Something wrong with that, y'all. If I ask God, I say, God, are you that cruel? Are you that uncaring? Are you that capricious that God, you will bless those who do not call you by, do not call by your name, do not love you like we do, and here it is, you won't bless those who who, who, who do love you? I mean, God, what, what is going on here? I mean, for real, think about this. You are out on the street talking and someone says, all right, so what about him? How do you explain that? God is love. God is a way maker. God is a door opener. And I'm going to have babies. So we realize here, and, 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 and what, what I was realizing when I was reading through this scripture here, was that God has stopped Hannah having babies. Not that she couldn't have them physically. She had everything she needed. She had a uterus. She had fallopian tubes. She had ovaries. They all worked. But God himself has stopped them. In fact, that brought this issue to my question. How much do we really like divine intervention? 
So we don't mind divine intervention when it opens the door, when it makes a way, when it gives us opportunity. But what about divine intervention when God says no? When God says, uh, you, no, you can't do that. Let's be for real. Uh, 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 I'm going to make you laugh. Um, there was a collective sound of ants in the world each and every time Halle Berry got married. Men across the world were mad. I mean, you should have seen them on Facebook, pages, uh, social media. How dare she marry him? As if we had the chance to marry her. All right? And here is many brothers like, okay, I don't want to be married now. If I get married, I'll be married. I'm like, wait a second. That's not the one. I got the one God has for you. He has one for you. But you know, you know what that is saying? That, that is saying that when it didn't work out, when God stopped it from happening, now we have a problem with God. Some of us have gone and applied for jobs and we thought we, we knew, we looked at the, the prerequisite for the job. We knew that we fit that job. I can't tell you how many churches I applied to as a pastor. I have had every requirement and then some. And then I look up and hear that they've hired someone due to splitting verbs. I mean, just not showing up to church. And I'm like, wait a second, you chose that one? Oh, and, and I had to realize, well, guess what? You know what God is saying? No, that's not right for you. Can we celebrate God when he does that? Now, I know this is a little hard to take because guess what? We grew up with the idea that everything good comes from God and everything bad comes from Satan. And that if it's bad, it can't be from God. It can't be God's doing. But here's the thing. Someone that, that's mature enough, that's been through some things, will, will, will be able to agree with me when I say there are some times when God sets this thing up and it feels terrible. It's, it feels horrible. It's painful. But in the long run, that thing ends up working itself out for us. Amen. In fact, I've been using this, this conversation all week about the physical trainer. No one likes a physical trainer when you first meet them. Or her. They're the worst people in the world. Ten more. Ten, you'll give me ten more. <laughs> ten more push-ups. You do ten more push-ups. I mean, they go home, you're hurting, you're in pain. You ain't got nothing nice to say about the trainer. And this goes on for weeks or months. And that you don't realize how valuable and how wonderful your trainer is until the night before or the night of the dance, the night of the, uh, the banquet, the night of the ball, the night of the event, and you put on that gown that you've been wanting to get into or that's what you want to get into, and then you find out how too big that gown is. Not only has the trainer worked you back down the size, the trainer worked you past where you were. So now you're sitting here, now is now, and, and every husband here should know what this, what this feels like. The ball is tomorrow, I don't have anything to wear. Let's go shopping. <laughs> Come on, every, every husband here, come on. I got you, I'm gonna protect you. I got you, she's not gonna mess with you. You can, you can amen on this, brothers. Amen. 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 Hey, thank you, amen. Amen, praise God. Amen. My, my mother used to make my father drive 200 some miles from one store just to get a gown to go to, go to a, a function that she gonna wear one time. And I used to say to him, I said, man, you ain't got to drive that. You ain't got to drive that. Stand up for yourself. Tell him no. And he'd be like, you ain't got to sleep with him. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God sometimes says no to us. And it doesn't feel good. It doesn't sound good. But are we able to deal with his no? Hannah wanted babies. God said, not yet. Hannah wanted a child to raise, God said, not yet. Hannah wanted to be in the mommy club, God said, not yet. And here it was, we see in the scripture that she is at wit's end. She is, she has had enough. She's upset. She stands all that she can stand. And here it is, she is declaring to God, I don't like this. And I want a child. And you haven't let me have a child. That's where we find our sermon this morning because she's in a place of desperation. She's in a place of wanting more and not being able to get more. And so the thing is, God wants us to look at this and, and deal with this because someone is in a place of desperation too. Now, I know you're dressed up. I know you've got your smell goods on, got your look goods on. You look like a brand, all of my brand new $100 bills. I'm trying to figure out how I can fold y'all up, put you in the wallet, take you home, all right? I know, you, I know we all look that way, but someone here, you know you are at a desperate place. 
You're here, you've given it all you can give, and things will change, Something you think something bad is going to happen. And God says, it's in our times of desperation that prayer is the answer. Amen. So we have a couple points, and I'm going to get out your way. Amen. Praise God. Uh, the first point is, prayer is submitting to God. Prayer is submitting to God. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we, we, we see the, Hannah's background, that they've been trying to have children, and they haven't had children. The first time we see her pray is when she goes to the tabernacle, okay? Now, my sanctified imagination wants to believe that she's prayed to God before then. The problem is her sound hermeneutics says I cannot make that assumption, that when you're interpreting scripture, whatever's on the page is what it is. Many times, preachers like to read something into it. And many times, that's how we see his question in our head. Like, how did you get that? Because we've been isogeny. We've been reading into the scripture the meaning that we want the scripture to have instead of letting the scripture speak for itself and exegeting, reading out of the scripture what it is the scripture wants us to say. In the scripture, it never says that Hannah spent any time praying to God for this baby. Mm -hmm. And I, that caught me. Because you know what we do? We spend so much time trying to work these things out that we need to work out, that God has called us to do, that many times we forget to go to the master before we start trying to work it out, and we spend all our time and energy trying to work this thing out, only to run our, run our fingers to a nub, only to stress ourselves out, and then when it doesn't work out, then when it's not the way, way we think it should be, then we pick up the phone and we call God, and here's the thing, we have attitude of God. We treat God like God's us. If you can do this. That's why I love that scripture when Jesus is talking with the Father. And the Father, and Jesus asks him, the Father, how long has the Son been? Like, how long has the demon been possessing him? And he tells him, and then the Father is it. Well, if you can do anything. And Jesus says, if, if I am the, I'm the Lord God incarnate, I can do every, everything that I want to do. And I do will to do will for it to be done. I'm saying all that for us to get right now, to get this morning, is that prayer puts us in a posture where we are willing to receive what God has for us. I'm going to be honest with you. Many of us don't want what God has for us. Be, come on, someone tell the truth here. Yeah. Don't let me be the only one out on, on front street like this. Come on, thank you, Chris. I appreciate you, brother. <laughs> Amen. Many of us have an idea of what we want, what we think we need. And the interesting thing, what we think we need is not what God knows we need. And what happens when God says you don't need that, we get upset with God and say, God, how dare you tell me what I need? I know what I need. And then we get upset when God gives us what he thinks we need. Amen. We say it's not shiny enough. It's not expensive enough. You know, and, and people, not everyone's going to run and chase after what this is. But guess what? God doesn't want everyone chasing after what he has for you. He wants them to chase after what he has for them. So sometimes what, you, what you're given does not look good to someone else, so that someone else doesn't steal your blessing from you. Amen. Y'all remember the story of the ugly duckling? Now imagine if you were the person that owned the, the ugly, ugly duckling. And here it is. You, you are a, a goose or a duck farmer, or a duck herder. And here it is, you got this one duck that's ugly. And here it is, you was you so upset the duck is ugly that you get rid of the duck before the duck it has a chance to mature into a full goose or a full duck, whatever it is. And then you come around and you see your neighbor, and your neighbor's got this beautiful goose, a beautiful duck. And you're like, hey man, where'd you get that duck from? I don't remember you. And the neighbor said, you remember the ugly duck? <laughs> that's how we that's how we treat the blessings of God. That God has given us, or God has said, no, you can't have it right now, but take this over here. And we get upset with God because it's not what we want. Instead of submitting to him, instead of praying, God, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Amen. Don't you know that when you are praying, you are saying that, God, I come to you because this thing is so big, so heavy, so, so, so terse that I can't even move it. I need you to move it for me. Yes. And the problem I have found, for me, is that there are times I don't want to believe that I'm capable of doing this. I want to believe that if I put my heart to it, put my mind to it, I can do anything. 
I got the, I got the rudest awakening. About three years ago, my wife and I were talking about, we're going to redo the front of the yard. And I said, okay, let's well, redo the front of the yard. So I got on my computer, and I create this plan, had where the plants are going to be and everything. She said, you think you can do all this? I said, yeah, I can do all this. And so she said, are you sure you can do all this? I said, yeah, baby, I can do all this. I used to do this with my uncle, and my and in fact, I used to teach my father how to do this kind of thing. And so she's like, well, what do you need? So I said, I'm going to need a tiller and all this and whatnot, and I'm going to go out there and do it. And so one Saturday, I got up early in the morning, went and got the tiller, cut the grass, started going. So she had gone out shopping with her, her mother and, and Ryan. Ryan was a little baby. They come back. I'm laying on the ground like this. I want y'all to see this. I'm laying on the ground like this. And she drove out the car. She said, what's wrong, baby? I can't move. I can't move. My body won't move. I'm so hurt. I'm so, it hurts so bad. And what that is so, literally, I had to lay there for about an hour. They left me. And that's how much you love me. She said, I told you. And left me laying right there in the yard. I mean, people just driving down the street looking. I'm like, what is yard? I couldn't move. Couldn't move. Rude awakening. That guess what? I can't do. Everything I think I can do. Amen. Now, try this on. One of my friends from college, not from high school, Troy, lost his father doing the same thing. Father had a heart attack in the middle of the yard, working in the yard, dead and gone. God had to show me I could not do this thing. God had to have me submit. Okay, you're going to have to get someone out here to help you to do this thing. And I had to. That's what prayer does. Prayer says I cannot do this thing by myself. I cannot lift this by myself. I cannot move this by myself. I cannot overcome this by myself. I need you. And so, God, I turn it over to you. Yes, yes, yes. The question that I have for us, how many of us come to this altar literally get down and pray and to, to God at this altar. Get up, pick up what we prayed about and take it right back out with us. Mm. Mm. Come on now, let's be for real. You, you're so worried about that thing that you pick it up and you take That's not submitting to God. You know that was? That was going through the motions. It looked good, it sounded good, but really I'm going to take it because I don't trust you, God. Mm. And then we worry and we're stressed about why that thing hasn't changed yet. Because many of us won't let it go. Amen. Hannah comes to the tabernacle. She's been ridiculed by Penina. Penina's giving her a hard time. Penina is, call, is, is talking trash about it. Look, look, you know how it is. Look, you got the dead womb. Mm -hmm. Ain't no life in your body. Ain't no baby coming from you. Maybe she doesn't know how to make babies. Maybe yeah. Elkhana kind of doesn't want to sleep with her. Maybe she stinks. Maybe her breast stinks. Maybe she can't do it. You, come on, you, you know how we can be. We can be real, real ugly. And here she is giving a hard time, so she's had enough. And she comes to the tabernacle and she says, God, I turn it over to you. I give this desire for the first time. She says, I give this desire. For the first time, she submits in her efforts to have a child. That's our first point. Prayer is submission to God. You're submitting to God. Our second point is we can't worry ourselves about what other people think as we're praying. Amen. I can make you, make you laugh. No, I'm not going to make you laugh. I'm just going to share, share this and, and see how many, we'll turn this way so I don't even see why I'm saying this. Every Sunday, I issue a call for Christian discipleship. Every Sunday, to come down here to meet me right here. And I watch how many people, I can see it on your face that you want to come, but you don't. Because you're worried that if you come, someone over here, someone over there is going to start asking a question. Why are you going down there? What's going on? What she did with it. How long she been doing it? Is that that crazy man I saw her with last week? He, I knew he was crazy. He must be mistreating her. And, and what happens, we sit here and we're so afraid and so worried about what someone else is going to say that we do not move out of those seats when it's time to come down to the altar and leave it right here at the altar. All right. Yeah, yeah. Hannah was there praying. And you know how it is. Sometimes you get you 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 got to get into the presence of God. You got to be there with God. You got to be in front of Him, and you start praying. And what happens? You're praying silently, but your mouth starts moving. So well, you know, imagine this is me praying silently, because I do know how to pray silently. All right, so.
to show up and show out so that God be able to be who I need to be. Now imagine I'm praying that in my mind, but now my mouth is moving. And so when Eli sees her at the entrance of the tabernacle, her mouth is moving, and the first thing the brother thinks is, she's drunk. I'm going to let y'all know something. My womanist side of me, and I'm not even a womanist theologian, but the womanist side of me, I didn't say feminist, I said womanist, all right? Uh, feminists are white women, womanists are black women, okay? My womanist side of me uh, said something wrong with that. Because my thought is this, how many times, this is the tabernacle, this is the, the house, the temporary, the mobile house of God. Only the priest can go inside. So people, it's not uncommon for people to come to the entrance and pray at the entrance. How many times have men come to the entrance and they've been praying and their mouths have been moving but none sounds come out and Eli has said, praise God, God may you grant the prayer request of that person without him judging them. Come on now. I know I'm not the only person when I pray that I move my mouth and I know I didn't start that. This is, this is probably something that is sustainable is systemic or, 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 or is, is consistent with people, period, throughout time. Why was it that when the sister came to the tabernacle to pray like that, she had, must be drunk. But when the brothers come, he's got none of the blessings to give. Mm. See, I was having an argument with another professor this week. And he accused me uh, of, of not being fair to the scripture. And I told him, I'm being very fair to the scripture. I said, the problem is you want to give persons an anesthetized view of the scripture. When the persons are sitting there and they're reading the same scripture that we are, and these are the thoughts they're thinking. Why is it that the male priest would diss a woman for coming to pray in front of the tabernacle, but would not diss a brother? And here's the thing. I give Hannah credit because Hannah does not let his womanism and his sexism stop her from getting her prayer request to God. Amen. See, the problem is too many of us, we're worried about what other people think about our prayer requests. This is why we end up dying, holding on to things, because we won't even share in our prayer groups what we're going through because we're worried that if they knew that we were struggling, that we were dealing with some things, that they would look down at us and they would think something wrong, something crazy, and stop helping us get this thing to God the way it needs to be. And here it is, we end up dying, suffering in a way that God never intended for us to suffer. Amen. We got to stop worrying what other people think about our prayers and our prayer life and our spiritual walk. We've got to start trusting God because here's the thing, there's no one else in all of existence that can help us with what it is we need help for. So why are we letting Deacon McMillan, I'm going to pick on him since he's on the front row, Deacon McMillan stop us from getting to God? Why are we letting Deacon Kinsley, the whole time I've been preaching, she's been looking at me like this. <laughs> coming through. My, my prayers are going to come through. We, too many times we let what other people who don't have a heaven to send us to a hell to put us in determine whether or not we're going to worship God. Amen. Amen. It's a time of desperation, y'all. We're at what's in, y'all. We need God. We ain't got time to worry about what folks say Amen. over here. Amen. 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 So our first point is prayer is submission. Amen. Uh, to God. Our second point is we cannot uh, be, uh, be worried about what other people are thinking while we're praying to him. Amen. Our last point is uh, prayer in a time of desperation has the power to restore our faith and confidence. One thing that I haven't shared with you yet was the consequences of Hannah not being able to have children. The word says she won't eat. She will not eat. That when they go, when they're going to the temple or the tabernacle, or when they're gathering, she's not eating. And, and the impression is, it's just not when she's there, she's not eating, period. Now, I don't have any obstetrician gynecologists in the room, do I? Oh, a I don't, amen. But let me go ahead and tell you what I remember when uh, Nicole and I were pregnant, amen, amen. Now, I know how you like that. We were both pregnant at the same time, amen. <laughs> Praise God. Because I tell you, I ate every day that she did, that she wanted to eat, but couldn't eat. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. And so, uh, uh, one of the things the doctor kept asking her when we were there, and she kind of looked at me like, okay, I can see the answer over here, is, are you eating? 
are you eating? It was necessary for Nicole to get a certain caloric intake, amount of her intake, so that not only could she sustain herself, she could sustain the baby, all right? Hannah cannot have, is not, God has prevented her from having children. She's not having children, so she's not eating. Therefore, she does not have the physical material that enables her, if she was to get pregnant, to sustain the baby. She, her own body is eating it, eating itself up. Because you know what happens when you don't eat? Your body starts eating your fat. Yeah. And your stored away food. And so here is her body is eating with. I bet that when she was at that tabernacle in front of Eli, she probably was 95 pounds. I bet she was as skinny as she could be. I was all sitting there like, hey, girl, how you do that? <laughs> Amen. Come on, somebody. You see a skinny woman in person, we say, how do you do that? <laughs> and here she is, she looked at us, like, how do you do that? <laughs> Amen. And, 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 and she's not eating. So here is it, even if her body wanted to get pregnant, it won't get pregnant because her body says, I can't sustain this. The consequences of worry. Now come on, tell the truth and shame the devil. There's some of us right now that are not eating, not taking care of ourselves, not exercising, not even resting because we're so stressed over well, how are we going to work something out. I was at a conference the last two days, a legal conference. I'm sitting beside this woman at the conference today. They finally gave us lunch. They used to make us go out to get lunch, but now they finally gave us. So we're eating, we're eating. And so she tells me she works for a biotech company. And here's and the thing is, she's she's worked for several companies. In fact, the last couple of companies, Pfizer has bought them all. All right. And so she said, this is my thing. I'll start a company, I'll get it up and running, and some pharmaceutical company will come on to buy it. I said, oh, that's interesting. She said, but I'm stressed right now. I said, why? She said, because I have to go on Wednesday and make a presentation to some donors to, 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 uh, make, to donate so that we can afford to do the biotech research. I said, really? And so she was talking to some guy. said, you need to tell her to rest. I said, all right, God, this is going to be real awkward. She doesn't know me. It's going to sound real crazy. God said, what did I tell you to do? I said, okay, God, I'll tell her. So she started talking to her. I gave her a look, and she's like, what's wrong? And I said, God told, Ted told me to tell you to rest. And she closed her eyes and she dropped her head. She says, I didn't want you to rest, but I'm so worried about getting this funding on Wednesday that I have been stressing myself out. I have not been taking the time to rest. And so then, so I said, all right, God, I see why you said it. What else you want me to say to her? God said, say this to her. A poor presentation because you're tired. It's just like you're not preparing at all. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you something. I, I was teasing uh, uh, Dr. Rembrandt and Deacon Rembrandt about that, but let's be for real. And I think I took teaching one Saturday at, 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 at a fire rehearsal. These three women would not have decided to marry us if our presentation was slack and terrible. If, if, if it was like, uh, you ain't doing nothing. I ain't doing nothing. My mama want me out the house. Your daddy want you out the house. You ain't got no boyfriend. I ain't got no girlfriend. Why are we get married? Come on, let's go to the to the all to the all get married. <laughs> who wants to who wants to propose like that? In fact, what we want is, you know what? I got to get down on my knees and shit. I can't breathe without it. I mean, I. I thought I knew what love was. I thought I knew what happiness was. See me and my wife all set over here. She thinks I'm really proposing to you. Amen. But you, you, know, you know the presentation. You want the presentation where the brother is talking from his heart. You want that so you can call your girlfriend like, ah! lay our heads down to go to sleep and we're still worried about that thing and even while we're sleeping it's in our dreams Amen. and when we wake up the next morning and we're so tired because in our dreams we've been fighting with the thing that we've been fighting while we're awake and so when we get there we look like death warmed over 
prayer and a time of desperation has the ability to restore us to where God would have us to be. Because check this out. Hannah, not being able to eat, not being able to sleep, comes to the temple and, and on the tabernacle. Amen. And she lays her prayer concerns out before God. And after she lays them out, and she gets Eli straight for his sexist, womanist, a, a, a womanizing thought process, he then gets back on the right path and says, may the Lord God bless you, woman, a woman of God, in your prayer request. She gets up and says she goes home and she eats. Her husband couldn't get her to eat. And her, in the words, her husband gave her a choice portion. In other words, if everyone else got, uh, got, got stupid, she got prime rib and ribeye and porterhouse and filet mignon. If everyone else has spaghetti, she got lasagna, the best lasagna made by Pastor Al. Amen. Praise God. Amen. 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 If, 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 if everyone got cookies, she, she, if everyone else got, if everyone got oatmeal cookies, she got the nice peanut butter and chocolate chip cookies. All right? She got the best. And here it was, she was finally able to eat it, to enjoy it. And the wonderful thing about our God is he doesn't just let her have, be restored in the sense of her mental well-being, her psychological well-being, but physically you know she was restored. Because as she's eating, God is adding to her body. She's giving her body what it needs so that when the body gets pregnant and it has a baby, it can sustain the baby. Not only that, but God ends up letting this woman get pregnant. That now when Elkanah comes to her, talking about, hey, what you doing? Yeah, you, you sleep? Come on, come on, husbands. Let's be for real. All right, okay, I'm the only one. Maybe hey, to stay away to tell the truth, I'm the only one. What you doing? You sleep? <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Now when that conversation happens in the middle of the night, guess what? The next morning she's in the bathroom going up saying, I think I've got some news to tell you, baby. I think I'm pregnant. And she's able to give birth to what becomes one of the greatest prophets in the Bible, Samuel. It's Samuel that God uses to anoint Saul. It's Samuel that God uses to anoint David and to get him straight being a king. It's Samuel that God ushers in this whole idea of kings or, 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 or monarchy for Israel. This prophet is so important to, to Israel that Samuel, God chooses you Samuel. And here's the funny thing. He had priests there. Eli was already there. But Eli had fallen short of the job. He had appointed his son, Hophni and Phinehas, to be prophets. They were evil. They were crooks. They were criminals. They were stealing money and perverting justice. God wanted to do a new thing. And her submission in prayer allowed God to do a new thing because God was able to birth a new kind of prophet that set the stage for prophets after that. Nathan became a prophet after that and really set that stage. Elijah became a prophet after that. Elisha, they are all following in the footsteps of Samuel. Samuel is that important to the will of God that he, he has become a model of what good, good prophetic service looks like. What is God doing with you? What kind of model is God creating in you? Here it is, you think you're just going through living your life the way you're living your life, and I'm through here. Uh, but guess what? God is using you to set up a model, a model of living, a model of believing, a model of faith, a model of ministry. And here it is, while you are doing your best to put two and two together to make it equal ten, God is using it and he's multiplying to a hundred. And when you sit back and look at how did I get at a hundred, because I know two and two don't equal ten, but you made it a hundred, God we will then realize that God is using us to create a standard, create a model that others can follow and that others will be able to serve him in the same vein. What if you as a teacher are now the model of teaching? What if you as a doctor are now the model of being a doctor? What if you as an engineer and now the model of being an engineer? You don't know what God has in store for you. Amen. But if you would just trust him and spend some time in prayer, God will not only restore you, but he'll make you into a model. Amen. 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 Let's do this.